Okay, now we are going to end our investigation into insect systematics with these last two orders with the Lepidoptera and the Trichoptera. Let's get going, shall we? So the Lepidoptera, these are commonly known as the butterflies and the moths. Lepido comes from the name scale. Okay, this means scale and terra for wings. Um, their wings are covered in these flattened hairs that we call scales. These scales will cover the body, the wings, all of that of most adult Lepidopterans. And it's these scales that produce that distinctive color pattern that we associate with many butterflies and moths. Uh, that's also why when you pick up a butterfly or a moth or you touch its wings, you get that dust all over your fingers. Those are the scales coming off of that body. These color patterns will play an important role in courtship and in recognition of these insects. This is the second largest order in the class Insecta, second only to the Coleopterans. Nearly all Lepidopteran larvae are uh, called caterpillars. So they exhibit the uh, holometabolous metamorphosis. They go through that egg, that larvae, and that pupal stage before they breed the adults. Now, you have heard uh, people talking about butterflies and moths as if they're different groups, right? I mean, we have these common names uh, for them. They look different, but this is really a, a rule of thumb, okay? Um, so let's talk about this sort of mm, difference between these common names. So the word butterfly, the word moth, they're largely the same. They are um, only sort of popularly known as different groups. There's no real scientific basis. There's no real standardized metamorphic basis for the difference in the names. The general rule when you're commonly calling these things butterflies versus moths, butterflies are out during the day. Uh, they tend to be brightly colored and they tend to have knobs or hooks at the end of their antennae. The wings, when they ha hold them at rest, they're held vertically over the back of the body. So you can see this here. Wings are held vertically when they're at rest, just in general. Remember, rule of thumb. Uh, in contrast, most moths are nocturnal. Uh, they, typ they typically are very drab in appearance. They typically have you know, grays and browns and blackish coloration. They tend to have thread-like or comb-like antennae. And then at rest, their wings are held horizontally against the substrate, or they're folded flat uh, over their back, or they're curved around their body. You can see that sort of here. Okay. However, you're going to find examples of uh, brightly colored insects that hold their wings uh, flat over their body that are out at night, or very drab, boring insects that hold their wings flat over the body that are out during the day. Uh, it's there's, there's no real genetic difference or common genetic difference between the two groups, which is why they're not scientifically named differently. They're just sort of all over the map. You get down to the species level, that's where we see some major differences. Okay. Now, most Lepidopterans will feed on nectar. Okay, they have these siphoning mouth parts. If you remember, that's made from the maxillae, okay, these extended maxillary uh, um, portions. And they have uh, these pollinating abilities because of that. So they are great pollinators. For the most part, butterflies and moths completely harmless in the adult stage. They really don't do anything. Um, the larvae can be really voracious pests. They uh, tend to have chewing mouth parts that will feed on plants. Some will feed on stored products. Some will feed on your clothes. You, know, you get moths in the, your wool sweaters or something like that. So larvae can be pestiferous. The adults are usually harmless. There are a, a couple of species of Lepidoptera, however, that have um, evolved interesting aspects to their proboscis to make them parasitic. These will feed on tears, on sweat, or on blood. So if you look at the proboscis here, so here we got this max, these two you know, portions of the maxillae that are really elongated, stuck together to form the proboscis. Down at the base, look at these teeth. 
right there. So these teeth are used to get into the flesh. Or in the case of these moths here, these moths will feed on the tears of warm-blooded animals. What they do is they wait until that animal goes to sleep. They use these proboscis to get in between the eyelids of those animals and irritate the sclera of the eye. This causes that eye to tear up and they can drink those tears. Here is a vampire moth, which is using these teeth to pierce into flesh and feed on blood. So they have evolved these, uh, this ability to open up an entirely new niche for these lepidopterans. Whether you choose to float like a butterfly or sting like a bee, you'll still get your chance to lap up the tasty tears of a choice crocodilian. That's what researcher Carlos de la Rosa noticed as both insects made their rounds to the spectacled caiman. Intriguing behavior is referred to as mud puddling and more commonly takes place on moist soil. But blood, sweat, and tears are also potential sources, allowing them to obtain some much-needed minerals and protein. The practice, of course, probably originates from the simple act of drinking water. But many butterflies and moths are capable of pumping excess fluid out their back end so that they may continue to extract nutrients such as sodium. Now the butterfly certainly benefits here, but I want to know about the caiman. Is this a mutualistic relationship or not? Throw out some ideas of how the reptile might be affected no matter how crazy or outlandish. I'll go ahead and propose maybe the butterfly acts as a giant eyebrow offering a bit of shade from the sun. Your guess is as good as mine. All right, the final order we are looking at are the Trichoptera. These are commonly known as caddisflies. So trichos means hair, while terra means wings. So these adults are covered with very long, silky hairs, with these long, silky seedy, right, that are all over most of the body and most of the wings. These insects are very common. They're found worldwide, and the larvae are aquatic. They may be abundant in some really, really cool freshwater habitats. In fact, these are the most diverse insect order whose members are exclusively aquatic. Interesting. The larval stages are found in lakes, in rivers, and in streams, and they're very, very important components of the food web. So a few members in New Zealand and in uh, Australia have larvae that are actually adapted to marine environments. So these larvae will live in tidal pools. How amazing is that? So there's very few insects that are actually adapted to salt water. These are or can be. Now, they, uh, these can be kind of boring in the adult stage, but the larvae do some really interesting things. Uh, the larvae uh, will make casings out of whatever is in their environment. So they use this as protection. So they make these little protective casings. They glue together pebbles and, and rocks and, and bits of bark, and they hide in there to hide from their potential prey. The adults are less conspicuous. They look a lot like boring moths. So if you look at them there, they most commonly occur along lakesides or streams. They're usually nocturnal. Um, and they're attracted to lights at night. Uh, they look a lot like moths, and because of that, Trichoptera are very closely related to Lepidoptera. During the day, they will hide in cool, mo moist environments, such as vegetation, along riverbanks, that sort of place. Alors les trichoptères sont des insectes qui sont présents dans la plupart des, des rivières de la planète. C'est un insecte donc très 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 fréquent et qui a la, particuli la particularité de fabriquer un tube de protection avec des matériaux qu'il qu en prend dans son milieu. Donc en général des cailloux, des petits morceaux de bois, des, des feuilles et parfois même des coquilles d'escargot. En me disant, je connais cet animal qui fabrique un, un tube artificiel avec des matériaux qu'il trouve autour de lui, et j'ai appris grâce à ses amis que l'or était présent dans la rivière. Donc je me suis dit, pourquoi pas Est-ce que l'animal à la nature euh, aurait le choix Est-ce qu'il pourrait prendre de l'or En tout cas, moi j'ai décidé dans, le, dans une structure artificielle, dans une sorte de laboratoire, de lui donner cet or, et l'animal n'a pas eu d'autre choix que de confectionner son étui avec l'or, puisque je l'ai privé de tous les autres matériaux.
le travail avec les tricoptères est un travail de collaboration entre moi et les tricoptères. Et disons que je crée les conditions favorables pour que les talents du tricoptère euh, puissent, euh, puissent éclore. Je crée les situations et je suis un peu comparable à l'architecte qui fait travailler les maçons. Comment les idées me viennent Le, le problème, c'est que je ne sais pas comment elles viennent. OK, so that ends our investigation of the lepidoptera, the trichoptera, and our entire investigation of insect systematics. You now have a pretty good overview of uh, most of the orders that are out there, some interesting stories about them, how to recognize them, that sort of thing. Now what we're going to do for the duration of the semester is we're going to take some of these orders, those that you are likely to see in your future careers, and we're going to really get to know them. So let me know if you have any questions.